You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Exodus 20, 3-6 Hello, welcome to Geekdom of God. I'm your host, Santir, and today I want to talk about the first and second commandments. This will be part one of a nine-part series looking into the Ten Commandments. It'll be nine parts, rather than the obvious ten, because the first two commandments are extremely similar, to the point where I'd claim the second commandment is an extension of the first one. So I'll talk about them together. The first two commandments, which I read off the top, are focused on the concept of having no other gods but the Lord God. Frankly, this topic is so important that I've already talked about it a great deal. So rather than dwelling on having no other gods before God and not making idols, I'm going to examine what God is talking about about in the latter portion, where he calls himself a jealous god. Before I do, though, I want to point you to some of those episodes I've already done on that very important primary part of these commandments. Specifically, check out these episodes. Episode 16, Why God Wants People to Worship Him. Episode 17, What Does the Bible Say About Money? Episode 24, Relying on God. Links to these episodes are in the description, so go check them out after you've finished watching this one. Getting back to today, as I said, I want to focus on the latter portion of this passage, specifically Exodus 20, 5-6. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. There are two topics from this that I want to examine. The first is the way God describes himself as a jealous God. The second is the declaration of punishment and blessing extending down generations. The description of God as jealous actually comes up somewhat often, typically in the context of jealous anger, such as in 1 Kings 14.22. Judah did evil in the eyes of the Lord. By the sins they committed, they stirred up his jealous anger more than those who were before them had done. This is the most common type of context for God's jealousy, as many passages talk about it in this way. It is at this point that it is important to create a distinction between two versions of the same emotion of jealousy. The first is the common definition of jealousy, which is wanting what others have. This is also often called envy or covetousness. This is an important topic, as the Tenth Commandment specifically prohibits covetousness. Of course, that also means it'll be getting its own episode, so I'll talk about it then. The second definition of jealousy is the desire for that which is yours. This type specifically comes about when someone steals from you. It often leads to anger. It is this type of jealousy that God has. This jealousy is for us. He created us, and so by rights we are his. Therefore, our worship belongs to him. However, when we seek after other things as gods, then God jealously desires us. The Bible often uses a marriage metaphor when discussing this. Ezekiel 16 is an extremely vivid example of this. I'm not going to read the entire thing due to length, so there's a link to it in the description. In this chapter, God compares Jerusalem with a prostitute who despises her husband and pays foreigners to have sex with her. While the entire passage is worth a read, I think the judgment pronounced in Ezekiel 16.38 demonstrates the overall sentiment being expressed. In it, God pronounces judgment on Jerusalem, describing her as an adulteress and murderer worthy of wrath. I will sentence you to the punishment of women who commit adultery and who shed blood. I will bring on you the blood vengeance of my wrath and jealous anger. The people of Israel knew a husband's jealousy to be a powerful thing. Proverbs 6.34 states this plainly. For jealousy arouses a husband's fury, and he will show no mercy when he takes revenge. Thus, God uses this metaphor so that the Israelites would be better able to understand his viewpoint. It makes it clear that their idolatry caused them to fall under God's wrath in the same way that an adulterous wife is subject to her husband's wrath due to her betrayal. Therefore, this description of God as a jealous God demonstrates the seriousness with which we should address idolatry. Okay, so what about the next part? For a refresher, let's look at Exodus 20, 5-6 again. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. When God talks here about the generational consequences of actions, whether good or bad, I think he's talking about the way parenting affects children and the way behavior gets passed down. Our environments growing up have a huge impact on us. 
This happens due to a combination of modeled behaviors, instruction, and the overall state of the environment in which we live. What things will influence us the most can vary, of course, but they will all affect us in some way. When those with the most influence on a child act in a sinful way, that behavior has lasting impacts on the child. The same is true when a person in a similar position acts in an upright way. Such people have a powerful influence on our understanding of reality. The impacts of negative behaviors are often felt several generations down the line, typically the three to four indicated in this passage, though not always. Thankfully, they do tend to weaken with each generation. But I think this generational impact, the influence parents have on their children, is at the heart of what God is talking about in this passage. It makes it clear that one of the consequences of unrepentant sinfulness is that it taints our offspring. However, if we model a pattern of humility, confession, and repentance, then that too can influence our children, this time in a positive way. In the end, this passage not only warns of the impact of parents' sin on their children, it also gives hope for the impact of righteousness as well. And it indicates that the impact of righteousness lasts much longer. That is, I think, some much-needed encouragement. Thank you for listening. Until next time, take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this week's Geekdom of God podcast. To support this program, go to patreon.com slash cntier. For more, you can visit geekdomofgod.com. Finally, you can email cntier at cntier at geekdomofgod.com.